Exodus 4. Moses is supposed to start leading the Israelites out of Egypt, and he's not exactly sure he should put his trust in God who just spoke to him through a burning bush. So God is about to try a whole bunch of other magic tricks to convince him to go along with the plan. Moses answered, What if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, The Lord did not appear to you? That is a very good question. Because if someone told me he heard a message from a burning bush, I would wonder if he was listening to it or smoking it. I don't know, maybe have God talk to all of them instead of sending a message through Moses since God clearly has that power? Hmm? This whole thing could be cleared up right away if God wasn't so lazy. But instead of doing that, God's just going to keep playing games with Moses. Then the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? A staff, Moses replied. The Lord said, Throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground, and it became a snake, and he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. So Moses reached out and took hold of the snake, and it turned back into a staff in his hand. This, said the Lord, is so that they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has appeared to you. That was pointless. If the Israelites don't believe the crazy man who wants to escape from Egypt because the bush told him to do it, why would they now believe Moses when he says his staff turned into a snake, then back again? You need to show them the trick, Moses, not tell them you saw a trick. No one at a magic show has ever been impressed by the audience. Then the Lord said, put your hand inside your cloak. So Moses put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, the skin was leprous. It had become as white as snow. Okay, this demonstration of magic took a dark turn, and of course it turned leprous. Moses took his hand out of his cloak before God said, Simon says. Now put it back into your cloak, he said. So Moses put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his flesh. I stand by what I said earlier. This is not helping Moses make his case to everyone else. You guys, shrubbery told me we need to get out of here. You need to listen to me because I have this staff which I swear became a snake for two seconds. And you should probably avoid shaking my hand because I tested positive for leprosy, but I swear it's gone now. Also, the rest of his flesh was restored too? Like, what else needed the Botox injection? Then the Lord said, If they do not believe you, or pay attention to the first sign, they may believe the second. But if they do not believe these two signs, or listen to you, take some water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the river will become blood on the ground. There we go. Finally! God says if they won't listen to your stories, show them this trick instead. I mean, the Egyptians will probably burn him alive since he's a witch, but what a way to go. Interestingly enough, in the book of Leviticus, God says, ye shall not use enchantment. In Deuteronomy, God says magic and magicians are abominations unto the Lord. Weird how God's 100% against magic unless he needs it for something, in which case, who really cares about the rules? God is totally a Republican. Moses said to the Lord, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech and tongue. The Lord said to him, Who gave human beings their mouths? Who makes them deaf or mute? Who gives them sight or makes them blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and will teach you what to say. This is now turning into a weird rom-com where God is going to use Moses like a ventriloquist dummy. And also, who cares if Moses can't speak eloquently? He has a magic trick he can do. He doesn't need to say a word. It's not clear to me if Moses actually struggles with speaking or if he's just nervous. Because if this is just about him being nervous, God's being a total jerk. I still don't get why God won't just do this himself. 
it would make everything so much easier. Though it would require God to stop being a bush. Because he's still a burning bush. Did you forget? Notice that God says he makes people deaf or mute or blind. Like, he chooses to do that. Because a lot of conservative Christians don't say that. They say that disabilities of any kind are the result of sin, or some BS like that. Here's God saying, don't blame Satan or sin for that stuff. I did it because I felt like it. But Moses said, pardon your servant, Lord. Please send someone else. Imagine sitting through all those proofs of God's existence and saying, I know you say you're going to protect me, but I'm just not sure. Like, what else do you need to see? How angry must God be right now? He's totally omnipotent, but he has to team up with the worst people to get anything done. Worst group project ever. But God knows how to get to people. So he's about to threaten Moses by saying he's not as talented as his sibling. A guy who didn't even exist, to our knowledge, until this very moment. Then the Lord's anger burned against Moses, and he said, What about your brother, Aaron the Levite? I know he can speak well. He is already on his way to meet you, and he will be glad to see you. You shall speak to him and put words in his mouth. I will help both of you speak and will teach you what to do. He will speak to the people for you, and it will be as if he were your mouth and as if you were God to him. But take this staff in your hand so you can perform the signs with it. This is so dumb. Why won't God just show his damn face to the people instead of this weird burning bush clown show he's putting on that now involves Moses, his brother, a staff that can become a snake, water that turns into blood, leprosy somehow, and God speaking through two different men like the climax of a Jeff Dunham special. Then Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Let me return to my own people in Egypt to see if any of them are still alive. Jethro said, Go, and I wish you well. Now the Lord had said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all those who wanted to kill you are dead. So Moses took his wife and sons, put them on a donkey, and started back to Egypt. And he took the staff of God in his hand. I am not sure why he needs to take his wife and son to a place where there were people who wanted to murder him. They may be dead, but if we've learned anything from the American South, it's that the descendants of losers hold a grudge. Also, given that Moses has doubted God this whole time, it's kind of weird that he's trusting God this much. Did you see how Moses said he has to go back to see if his people are still alive? There is no mention that the reason Moses left in the first place was because he murdered a dude and needed to leave. Also, sons? He had one, Gershom, back in Exodus 2. So where did these other sons come from? Moses may be slow of speech and tongue, but he apparently knows how to use both of them in the bedroom, if you know what I mean. The Lord said to Moses, When you return to Egypt, see that you perform before Pharaoh all the wonders I have given you the power to do. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then say to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord says. Israel is my firstborn son. And I told you, let my son go so he may worship me. But you refuse to let him go, so I will kill your firstborn son. Yes, win over the new guy by threatening to murder his sons. Or all the Egyptians, if that's what he means. That's the key to victory. If God is hardening Pharaoh's heart, doesn't that suggest Pharaoh isn't really a bad guy? Like, he's not going to say no because he wants to. He's going to say no because God's making him do it. Which means Pharaoh really isn't as bad as we think. God's the real bad guy here. Now you would think the next thing we're about to hear is Moses speaking to Pharaoh. That is not what comes next. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met Moses and was about to kill him. But Zipporah took a flint knife, 
cut off her son's foreskin, and touched Moses' feet with it. Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me, she said. So the Lord let him alone. At that time, she said bridegroom of blood, referring to circumcision. What the hell was that? Why is there a random torture scene in the middle of a magic show? And how come the Lord met Moses? I thought God only appeared as a burning bush. But when it comes to baby foreskin, God's like, forget the costume, I need to be here for this. It's like God had this plan designed perfectly, until Moses couldn't find enough confidence to just go along with it. And when that problem was resolved, God found out Moses had an uncircumcised son, and God snapped. I know that says Zipporah touched Moses' feet with their son's foreskin, but in other parts of the Bible, it's clear that the word feet doesn't mean feet. Like in Deuteronomy, there's a verse that talks about how a baby comes out from between its mother's feet. And in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel condemns a loose woman by saying she opens her feet to everyone who passes by. I think feet means genitalia, which means this verse is way more disturbing than it already was. Anyway, with that little interlude out of the way, let's get back to the story. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he met Moses at the mountain of God and kissed him. Then Moses told Aaron everything the Lord had sent him to say, and also about all the signs he had commanded him to perform. Ah yes, the brothers making out. The Bible is all about those traditional values. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. That's it? All that build up for this demonstration involving snakes and leprosy, and all we get is, they believed. Moses and Aaron didn't even turn the Nile into blood yet. Well, after all that, it looks like Moses and Aaron have the confidence of the Israelites, so they can finally take them all out of Egypt and into the land of milk and honey. As long as they can convince Pharaoh to let them go. I hope someone took that one child to a doctor though, after his deranged mom took a flint knife to his penis to appease the Lord's bloodlust. But what is the Bible, if not a book about penises and blood mixed with a whole bunch of filler?